wanted to uh, have this presentation very interactive, so just a very, very, very few introductory, uh, actually, words. Uh, Dimothy Garten Ash once wrote that uh, Central Europe should be considered, and for himself, it is the kingdom of spirit. And uh, the, we were asked by the organizers actually to adapt the presentation to the environment, local environment here uh, at this conference and to focus more on digital agenda and technologies and digital revolution. So the question might be, uh, do we want to actually uh, transform Central Europe from the kingdom of spirit to the kingdom of digital uh, technologies and uh, actually the hub of digital technologies. This might be the leading actually uh, somehow uh, life for uh, today's session. But uh, first, uh, let me start uh, with a very basic question for our guests. Uh, why do we speak about scenarios uh, in case of Central Europe and not just one scenario that you would agree on, and the second is why 2025, and then we will proceed from okay. Olite, please. So uh, I'll also give out the copies so everyone has it. Uh, you go. Uh, the exercise of scenario building has been uh, has has been. Uh, sorry. Um, it's a structured answer to, to the questions that are otherwise scattered around the region and they are being asked to anyone who is from the region or knows something about the region of Central Europe. So you, you probably have been asked by your colleagues even, if you're from here, um, where is this region heading? What is this Visegrad's have to say, what does it think? Why, why is this, why are these countries behaving different than it seemed to be expected uh, in general? Why they are, they are different, but some people of course put a value judgment in there, but regardless of that, uh, you can see that certain <coughs> behavior, political behavior of, of the countries of this group uh, seems to be coordinated, seems to have an idea or have to has idea uh, or uh, ideas behind it that um, doesn't allow to say with a certainty um, what will be the strategy for the future. So it seems altogether that the, the region has been um, on, a, on a path, on a path that has been pretty much pre-designed for the last uh, 30 years. Um, the, design, the design came with the ambition to escape East, join NATO, escape Eastern Bloc, Eastern ex experience, political experience of the Eastern Bloc, uh, join NATO, then join the EU, and then implement uh, the policies that were agreed upon. So that was a lot of homework and uh, kind of a predefined path that the Central Europe was uh, either taking or, or rejecting, but fortunately it did uh, took, uh, it, it, it take this, uh, this predefined path. At the turn of the third decade of these changes, we see that there are so many uncertainties, global uncertainties, um, as to the future of Europe, as to the future of security arrangement, multilateral world, but importantly also, the digital world came into play and changes not only economy, but society and democratic institutions all around the world, that these trends seem to be more amplified in the region and, and that they come to play and interact with, uh, with, uh, uh, also with the moment in the, in the history of the region where the countries actually do not have a, a concrete, a clear vision of what they want to achieve in the future. There is an obvious question hanging in the, uh, and it's not a low hanging fruit, um, but the question is in the air, uh, you know, what sort of Europe uh, do these countries want, or what sort of positive projects do they want to come up with, and their answers aren't there. The countries, however, were able to say no, loudly and clearly, when it came to certain European policies, it seems like there is a still a process of maturing the um, uh, the, kind of the, the positive program, if any, can come out of Central Europe. And in this uncertainty and in this sort of uh, 
context, we, we came up uh, with a scenario building exercise, uh, design and structure pretty much uh, by your program from Jim. Um, and we put together also a group of people we've been working on, who are working with um, uh, from, from the region uh, to collectively think, not necessarily agree, but uh, think of different divergent uh, possible scenarios for, for the future of the region. Um, and the people who took part, we can briefly th go through this. Uh, uh, they, they were not, you know, not necessarily uniform and homogeneous group of people. They are think tankers, entrepreneurs, journalists, uh, often also disagreeing among each other um, because of even political preferences. And um, and the outcome were was. Uh, edited by us uh, to be five scenarios that present the, the key mechanics uh, uh, of these political developments. Yeah, I'm going to come to these five scenarios yeah. immediately, but I have one question, very brief one, introductory one to you. Why 2025? That's completely arbitrary. There is nothing, I mean, if you search for some scientific region, uh, reason, there is not. The simple thing that we basically observed is if you look at these, uh, these seven years until then, uh, you see already now that there's a couple of, uh, sort of events or dates or, or cycles that are built into this. If you look at election cycles, in, for instance, the US, right, 2020 and 2024. If you look at the, the budget cycle of the EU, uh, a new one will start in 2020, then run for seven years. In Russia, there will be a, a question about the possible succession or not of the, of the current president. Uh, so there is there is a number of uh, of events basically that, that puncture this uh, this period of time, and that all, uh, in one way or another, uh, as we see it, uh, will have an impact on uh, on Central Europe. You can add others. I mean, you can add uh, technology, if you will. I mean, I think we we all know that uh, sort of in a relatively short time span, uh, we'll see a number of fairly groundbreaking uh, transformations in, in our economies, whether it's e-mobility, whether it's digital. Um, so there's one element that that doesn't require a time frame of say 20 or 30 years that you would normally apply to uh, apply to scenarios. Uh, so for these reasons, we took that relatively relatively short time frame, um, but it could have been 2028 or 2024, you know. Uh, I mean, typically you then, for sort of PR purposes, you go for, for numbers that have some form of resonance, a 25 or a seven or, um, but this is not a this is not a mathematical figure here that we are applying. Okay, thanks. Uh, how about the first scenario for Boykin? Would you like to introduce it or? Yeah. So I guess we can go very shortly and briefly. Uh, how how this? <clears throat> so what 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 can be important for the region? And not necessarily only for the region is a triumph of the liberalism that you can see already. Uh, some of the democratic processes and institutions are hollowed out by, you know, they're, they're becoming a facade by otherwise non-democratic uh, governments. Um, the, the, rise, the rise of um, national interest agenda over multilateral uh, preference for multilateral uh, European order um, can be a signal of this, and uh, as quickly as in in the upcoming European elections, European parliamentary elections in May 2019, uh, and as late as uh, in a couple of other elections uh, across uh, across the region and in Europe, you can you may see uh, a confirmation of a larger European trend in which countries of uh, the region are trendsetters. Hungary, uh, very much so, but also Poland, and to a considerable degree, as we can see, uh, uh, Czech Republic as well, um, in, in, in pulling out from a commitment towards having to building up a uh, European uh, project as an institutional project and resorting only to, to upkeeping certain necessary procedures that, uh, and, that keep and can upkeep. And for the time being, uh, freedom of movement or free market, 
But otherwise, opting out and trying to opt out as much as possible from, from any common, common space in Europe, common political space in Europe, uh, that will, uh, in effect, produce perhaps a temporary state. Uh, it, this scenario cannot continue forever. It can, it's not a permanent, stay final stage scenario, but uh, uh, it will create a, a different dynamics. <clears throat> and uh, and um, it will transit into into one or or the other uh, of these uh, later on. It's a very short take on it, but uh, also in the report you'll find a page for each scenario where you can read exactly on the, the dynamics that um, uh, that we think and see plausible uh, as an outcome of our. The second one, York. Right. Um, I mean, if this first scenario that uh, 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 Wojtek just briefly indicated is basically uh, uh, one whereby uh, sort of the EU becomes much less of an integrated uh, entity, you, know, you have a re-emergence much more strongly of the nation states. I mean, we have ties even amongst them uh, becoming less important. Uh, we also Democracy and individual nation state becomes much more, much more nominal and hollowed out. Uh, this one basically goes a slightly different direction. It basically says that this uh, this trend that is sort of uh, really strongly pronounced in Central Europe, whether it's illiberal, whether it's sovereignist, nationalist uh, in uh, in politics, uh, this remains strong in Central Europe. Um, and if you look at the current, let's say, standing of PIS and Poland, uh, the PDS party in, uh, in Hungary, that for the time being there's no indication that these, uh, these will lose their, their appeal and their power. But what you have at the same time is that uh, sort of further west, this trend doesn't, doesn't gain that much traction. Uh, so let's say the, the alternative for Germany in, uh, in Germany, which is an equivalent sort of sovereignist, uh, sort of liberal party, basically remains confined to, to be a smaller player in, uh, in politics. Uh, same goes for other countries in the European Union. So you, 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 you have a development whereby the sort of central European political trend doesn't become uh, a European main, uh, mainstream. Uh, instead, you have a development whereby the EU finally sort of manages to get out of this permanent crisis mode that we've had in the last 10 years between the Eurozone crisis, the refugee crisis, the security crisis, and the aftermath of Ukraine. So uh, you have a situation whereby uh, the EU sort of recovers at least some of its, its energy and, and momentum and forward development. Uh, and what, what happens then is you, you basically have a certain tension between the countries of Central Europe emerging and, uh, and the EU. Um, whereby on the, on the EU side you do have a sort of integrationist trend continuing and on the, on the Central European side you have a, a, a remaining sort of fairly strong sort of national sovereignist uh, uh, momentum. Uh, and individual countries will find very different ways of resolving that. Uh, that tension. I mean, it's imaginable in, a, uh, in this scenario that one of the countries, we point to Hungary here, will actually exit the European Union. Um, another country like Slovakia, which is the only Eurozone country in Central Europe, uh, will do everything it can to stay in the sort of uh, in the core Europe uh, that, that continues the integrationist path. And for both the Czech Republic and Poland, there's a, a, a I mean, there's a less clear uh, path. I mean, what we imagine for Poland is that the sort of the nationalism of the current government will eventually moderate uh, and soften, uh, and over time the country will, perhaps with some support and uh, uh, also financial and political support from the uh, from the European Union side, will sort of return into the uh, the integrationist mainstream. And for the Czech Republic, frankly, we imagine something, uh, something like a very strong sort of uh, uh, momentum uh, that's uh, uh, towards redefining its, its place in Europe that may end up eventually with something like a sort of Swiss solution whereby uh, the country stays in the single market but uh, sort of uh, steps out of uh, the more political integration of the, uh, of the European Union. I know this may seem far-fetched uh, if, you look, uh, if you look at the Czech Republic today, uh, but if we remember how Brexit started, it's an accidental uh, uh, exit, right? Um, David Cameron didn't want this. 
And we do see that there are some of the, the ingredients in place also in the Czech Republic, in the political party landscape, also in public opinion, uh, that may amount to a similar accidental development in the direction of, uh, of a referendum and uh, then a decision about how to redefine its uh, status in the European Union. At the end of uh, all of this, is you have uh, basically four countries that take very different development directions in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and that's why we call it Central Europe Fractured, because, uh, because at the moment, the Visegrad countries often appear uh, to be a relatively visible group. Uh, but this would basically be a falling apart of this political um, grouping uh, in Central Europe. Out of these five scenarios, I have to say that the next one at least for, to me, it has the most this mysterious thing. Wojtek, what does the shotgun wedding mean? So, shotgun wedding is a, um, it's a, it's a literary or popular culture term um, for a situation where, because of external factors, you need to take the necessary decision <coughs> or you feel the urgent necessity to, to take it. Well, you imagine the groom with a father of the bride with a shotgun pointing at the groom to, 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 um, um, for the wedding to take place. This is what it, exactly we, we also see might be um, a possible, a plausible scenario in which because of the um, two factors, uh, the Central European countries may one by one or collectively um, join Slovakia in deepening the integration, Eurozone membership, and even further, taking further steps towards being closer to EU. These are not nice factors, on one hand, um, that uh, involve the uh, you know, possibility of economic crisis within the next seven years, something that we, we take for granted, perhaps, the current economic development and unprecedented unemployment rate which is record low in the countries of Central Europe. But the economic cycles have this particular feature that they come and go. They, um, we're now in the, in the um, perhaps top tier of the, of the cycle. We, will, we may see within the next seven years a downturn in the economy that will uh, endanger the economic model, or may endanger, not necessarily have to, the economic model of uh, Central Europe. Now, this is this, is this an ugly part. The good part, there would also be a necessity for this scenario to, to play out, would be that the European Union actually comes out, uh, comes up with um, a package uh, that is um, that shows resilience of the bloc itself, and then can offer assistance also to the countries to bail them out of the trouble um, looming ahead. It should, uh, for instance, be a financial crisis. But another possibility. That, uh, that is there on the horizon is not a financial crisis. I mean, of course, many factors can over, um, override each other. Uh, there can be a potential conflict, not in the south, but somewhere in the east. We've been seeing that uh, recently with the potential losing popularity of Vladimir Putin, for instance. There is another, yet another conflict that is out of control of Moscow that uh, and out of control for uh, other uh, uh, countries uh, eastwards of Central Europe, uh, which generates a, a, a wave of refugees. Um, and not only that, with the then hybrid warfare and disinformation and <coughs> accelerating, some of the countries of Central Europe may feel much more exposed and may need and feel that they need uh, uh, Im immediate assistance from uh, the countries of the alliance, NATO alliance, but also the EU. Should this assistance be effective and promising, uh, without changing the current leadership of this government, uh, in, in the government of these countries, the governments of these countries, uh, you might, you might ch see a change of hearts or change of attitudes towards the EU project itself. And along with the population of these countries, uh, there the would be a support for deepening the integration, otherwise currently uh, on hold or, you know, not happening much more um, in, the, in the countries of, of Central Europe. So this is, this is the whole mystery about, um, you know, the, otherwise the popular culture title. Okay, thanks. The next one. 
be more optimistic despite the fact that it starts with the crisis. So, you're about yeah. more optimistic scenarios. I mean, this is probably the, the sort of most idealistic of these scenarios. Uh, I mean, the ones that we that we already went through, they're all sort of very political, as it were, in their, uh, in their logic. Uh, this is one that is less political as it is uh, generational. Um, and our sort of observation and starting point with that was that if you look at uh, only a 20th century history in Europe, you see that there is a sort of generational interval at which you have major events. The First World War, the Second World War, 1968, especially in Western Europe, uh, 1989 then. Uh, so there is something of a, of a generational interval here. We're not saying that it's generations that made these events, but the other way around, that these events basically shape generations and also their, uh, uh, their thinking and behavior when it comes to, uh, when it comes to politics. Uh, and we have the impression that, I mean, 1989 is quite some time ago, uh, that uh, sort of this, uh, this generational sort of event or, or, or turning point uh, may well happen at some stage in the, uh, in the coming years, um, if you follow that regularity of, uh, of European history. Uh, and we do imagine that there, is, uh, that there is a possibility for something that is sort of driven by a next generation that it combines with technology, um, kind of technological 1968, if you will, um, because there clearly are, uh, are issues, especially for the younger generations, that are unanswered and are largely unanswered uh, under the politics of the, of the day. If you look at anything like welfare policies, even education policies, then I don't have the impression that, uh, uh, that governments in the region, as well as in ever so many places in Western Europe, are particularly good at catering to the needs of those next generations. I mean, politics is very status quo oriented. You basically uh, uh, sort of deal with um, uh, with reliable electorates and so on. Uh, so there is investment into sort of middle-aged uh, generations. If you think of 500 Zloty initiatives in, uh, in Poland, uh, the older generations, of course, when it comes to uh, to pensions. But there is underinvestment, in my view, when it comes to uh, sort of building sustainable social welfare systems uh, and building also uh, sort of forward-looking uh, education systems. Uh, and I think we've seen some indication of the sort of uh, unhappiness amongst younger, uh, uh, younger generations in Central Europe on this recently. I mean, there were fairly large protests that revolved around education issues in Hungary, in Slovakia, so I do think there is, uh, uh, there is a degree of energy there. And then you can obviously, in our discussion later on, you can pair this with, uh, uh, with a technological development. Uh, and you can, uh, you can imagine, that's how we imagined it in the, uh, in the illustration, um, uh, you can imagine that this, this will have a political impact or a political outburst uh, at some stage. Finally. Wojtek, this is the gloomiest scenario, actually, uh, of all. So, you please go so, ahead. So the most, you know, if, if you, anyone asks what's, I think uh, Ed Lucas, economist, uh, the editor of The Economist, had, uh, had this phrase very, very nicely put, uh, put out. Uh, you know, Central Europe is not a geographical expression, it's a collection of worries. This scenario embodies the typical Central European mindset everything is falling apart and we're doomed. The scenario in which uh, the current international order and security um, system uh, enabling Central Europe actually to break out of the historical dependencies, the dependency of, uh, on, of uh, being, the, being so much dependent on the East and instead being part of the free world system, that uh, that that is shaky, and that is uh, not um, not should not be taken for granted. Um, even though there is a more of uh, even American investment into the defense uh, in Central Europe, you see the numbers growing. The the very fact, the very um, agreement on collective defense and collective action 
a multilateral uh, arrangement of the world is, well, if not coming to an end, then at least being challenged from many sides uh, all of a sudden. And should there be a situation not necessarily taking place in Central Europe, like uh, a potential military conflict, however unwanted and uh, hopefully not happening, uh, but it may happen between the US and China and much, you know, so, so much further part of the world from, from this region, the, the attention and the, and the um, commitment to the security infrastructure in and the region uh, of the United States as the main guarantor may be put into the question. And while being put into question, may also be put it into a test. It doesn't even have to happen. If you think of this scenario as a, as a fear, as a scenario that some governments are fearful of, especially taking these four countries, especially Polish uh, uh, case, you may already see that the government is kind of, kind of strategizing or playing out tactics for its own uh, sake to, uh, to save itself in such a scenario. Uh, from, from the most unwanted consequences of being dominated, for instance, by Russia. So it is r willing to risk uh, uh, multilateral arrangements and bypass them uh, in order to offer for Trump uh, and go directly to the US to ask uh, to, 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 to try to have a bilateral agreement. Because of the similar motives or the similar uh, understanding that this might be a situation, you can also try to understand Viktor Orban's uh, position, seeing that, well, the world that used to guarantee the trajectory of the last 30 years or even earlier is coming to an end, something new is coming. We are willing to seek different opportunities with countries that are otherwise not so, you know, I mean, they, we don't have a, we don't have a, or don't feel a direct threat from, like Russia, and to do more business with them, despite being members of the Western Alliance that is on the uh, on the conflicting trajectory with the, with the Russian perspective on the on the security and also on the region. Uh, other countries of the region may, uh, in Slovakia or Czech Republic, may simply take yet another perspective and see. Well, we want to be as much connected and integrated with the whatever is Europe uh, in this situation. Germany most likely because of the economic ties and uh, cultural proximity, that we are happy to even withdraw from certain security uh, agreements, not to be binded by it, choose neutrality and, and play a, a little bit more like uh, Austrian or, or Swiss card, uh, enjoying uh, buff buffer zone all around us, well Slovakia maybe not necessarily, but more or less for Czech Republic it would work. And this is, um, this is uh, something that comes uh, also importantly with an increased, uh, with changes in the societies, in the, dem in the democratic systems of this country, where uh, in order to uh, answer the increased demand for security in the societies, the governments have a freer hand to, to uh, curb liberties uh, uh, and, and privacy, for, in order to deliver security that is necessary. And that's not a science fiction. This is not only what has happened during the migration uh, crisis and you've seen you know, uh, uh, full, uh, fully armored military men in this, on the streets of Brno, Strava, Prague and whatever, uh, but uh, importantly that, that has been taking place uh, already historically in the interwar period or even before when Central Europe uh, was, was exactly looking these different bilateral uh, arrangements with bigger powers in order to, to uh, save at least part of its sovereignty, uh, individual countries. And that, of course, means uh, end of the region as well as a, as, as a political entity on, on, the European, on the European continent, but not necessarily end of uh, sovereignty of, of individual countries. Thank you very much. Uh, these are the five scenarios. I have to just add that, uh, of course, they do not present any exhaustive uh, answer to the future developments, and they are faced with the changing. They are facing the changing reality. Just to mention that uh, you have had several presentations in the last 
a couple of weeks, but uh, in the meantime, we had uh, US midterm elections, for instance, uh, and uh, other actually events are happening. We have uh, the agreement on Brexit actually to be perhaps signed uh, quite uh, soon. So uh, it's, it's actually developing the situation and uh, perhaps these scenarios can provide us with a uh, solid basis for further uh, actually thinking on the development in Central Europe. An integral part of this scenario uh, is the uh, recommendation part where actually the stakeholders are recommended to uh, actually uh, do some steps that would uh, make uh, Central Europe to become a prospectively developing region and a digital superpower, as it is mentioned in the last paragraph. So there is certain connection with the uh, actually topic of uh, today's conference, also in the uh, in the in the scenario document. Uh, despite the fact that uh, most of the actually authors that contributed to the development of scenario are uh, either political scientists or actually security policy analysts uh, or perhaps some economists, but we didn't have uh, that many actually stakeholders who would represent uh, startups or uh, any actually um, progressive, so to say. Uh, we had we had some some, yeah. but some. Okay, uh, let's uh, open the debate uh, now and we are very much looking forward to your views uh, on uh, those scenarios. Perhaps uh, you would add something at the sixth scenario or propose the sixth one or the seventh one. Uh, everything is uh, more than welcome. Please open the floor. Yes, please. Um, so, uh, regarding the one with the new political class, I mean, isn't a major impediment Regarding our scenario, the fact that so many people just, you know, just emigrate from the country. If they don't like it, they don't try and change the system. They leave. I suppose the question then is, do they come back? But it seems that, sort of, in the absence of people, it, when people kind of feel that it's just in them, like, more in their own interest to simply leave and to try and change things, it seems quite unlikely that there could be some kind of political renaissance that could really take hold across the uh, society. Uh -huh. Yeah, a fair point. Also, uh, demographic uh, pyramid is not uh, uh, increasing the likelihood of this scenario. If generation change occurs, it usually is with a, 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 a kind of on a demographic curve that that is that pu puts young people on the on the rise. So currently, we have uh, we we're nearly behind the curve. There is still the um, people in their uh, in their thirties. Or, or around 20s, 30s, they, uh, they're still, um, how do you call that, on the, yeah, in the, in the in, uh, they come from the demographic uh, vis, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, it's a Polish term and I'm trying to translate it. And, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, thanks. Um, but this, this is soon to, to end. On the other hand, again, uh, thinking 1980s, uh, you had a, a big proportion of people who were mobile, agile, entrepreneurial, leading in the 80s. Um, so, and, and yet, there was a, there, there was a, a moment in which um, they were they were playing a part. So I think. Uh, remembering how York also presented it, it's important to say that uh, these are not necessarily the generations that shape the events. The events are in need then to, to be embodied in a, in a new generation, and that may uh, happen. And you see already a mobilization that is, hasn't, these countries haven't seen for quite some time recently that has political force. In Slovakia, um, the protests pushed the prime minister off the government. I mean, he should have resigned himself without the protests and so on. But the protests were uh, having a, a political mobilization of force. Uh, or the so-called black protests in Poland recently were also politically um, very effective. Um, these were uh, against the, these were protests against the governmental plans to uh, change the, uh, the laws on procreation. And, and women took to the streets. So, very much also 
using uh, digital, um, uh, digital culture, you would say. And not to say that they simply use Facebook, but they organize themselves in a network way, that without a clear leader, and uh, uh, they benefited in a way from, from this form of organization uh, and, and all the internet channels. And that is something the, the government, or the current elite, political elites, were not able to foresee um, and to react to. Just to, um, to add to that somewhat analytically, I think there's two assumptions basically in the question. One is uh, instead of change comes from sort of vanguard style groups that have a political plan are oriented to implementing that change, right? Um, so that's there's a sort of pro-European liberal group that sort of wants to return these countries to the to the original path of European integration, democracy, uh, uh, back from the sort of digressions that uh, that we may see in individual countries. Uh, so there's a there's an assumption that requires that orientation. The other one is an assumption that they have to be numbers uh, that are significant majorities and so on. I think you can challenge both. 1989 was significantly driven by nationalism. Uh, it was about sort of independence from Soviet hegemony. Uh, and I remember the demonstrations in East Germany. It was very quick to see the shift from we are the people to we are one people. So that, that nationalism that drove this development was very, very strong. And I think without it, 1989 would not have succeeded. Where did it lead? It did lead to democracy, European integration. So somewhat counter counterintuitive, right? The second is numbers. Uh, especially with the help of technologies uh, in the last couple of years, we see the amplification of the position of relatively small groups into what all of a sudden appears to be huge societal sort of segments. Um, I mean, it's very easy these days, basically, to blow um, a position out of proportion and to make it appear uh, almost a majority uh, in society. Some of this is also sort of enshrined with the sort of media uh, system and coverage that we have. Uh, if you take the, uh, the independence march in Poland uh, last weekend, of course, right? <laughs> what did get coverage? A handful of people that are hardcore nationalists. Uh, I mean, ninety percent of the um, uh, of the people in the streets of Warsaw were not, uh, but they were basically subsumed into that one position that is sort of in a, in a sensationalist way, basically in the in the focus of, uh, of the media. So what I'm saying with all of this is, um, I think you need an an agile, maybe also committed uh, group, um, but then especially also with the help of media logics and uh, and digital. You can have an impact in societies that is much larger than the group in terms of numbers would suggest. So, in in response to to the question, I think we need to be careful with the some of the assumptions. Um, uh, actually, emigration um, could actually be a benefit to this. I mean, we talk about like in network uh, discussion, social networks like breaking the filter bubble. I mean, in that sense, you're physically breaking the filter bubble of your country by leaving. And a lot of this can actually change. I mean, I see it in, in somewhere like Ireland, a really well known immigrant uh, country, and they had, I mean, divorce was illegal in Ireland up until 1996. And now they're considered one of the most liberal thinking, you know, um, forward thinking countries in Europe now. And a lot of that is driven by young people emigrating getting exposed to new ideas and new ways of looking at things and bringing that back. And the technology actually just amplifies their ability to do that even without actually going back to the countries. So I see this, this immigration thing might actually, you know, depending on your point of view, might actually be a benefit for moving countries in this right direction and liberal direction. To, to, to just add to that and to uh, help you get to my point, um, the diasporas are often very influential way, well, kind of, or voting blocs. I mean, in Romania, uh, in the presidential election, I remember they were trying to actively, you know, sort of make the, the, the process of the postal vote as difficult as possible because this is a very homogenous voting block, an influential one. And they also have the power then to also organize protests. So the diaspora can certainly still play a role. 
Um, I mean, the interesting thing you have with that is that, I mean, the Romanian government's actually trying to disenfranchise the, uh, the, the sort of uh, diaspora, as it were. I mean, they've made it particularly difficult for Romanians residing abroad in other EU countries to vote in some of the last elections because they know this is not our electorate. Uh, whereas in turn, if you take Orban in, uh, in Hungary, he's trying to hand out voting rights basically to minorities abroad, uh, connected with benefits in order to create an additional voting block for himself. So, uh, I mean, there's no straightforward answer on, uh, on diasporas. Uh, I think voting results of polls in the United Kingdom are somewhat sobering as well, because it's not a more European position that they would vote for. Rather, a fairly um, uh, one that's fairly close to the current government. If I may, coming from the academia, a methodological question: What was the procedure for coming up with this scenario? So, was it the Delphi method, or how did you how did you come up with that? And then, since you also have recommendations at the end, I was wondering what are what is your prioritization of the light of the different scenarios as you try to do that as well? And is that reflected in recommendations, or how did you come up with recommendations? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I can answer on the methods, but not the methodology, <coughs> because the, how we came up. Well, it's it's a it's a work that is um, partly journalistic, mm -hmm. partly think. I mean, it merges hopefully the best. Uh, features of, of these uh, two, of think tank and, and, and journalistic work, where um, we did in a systematic way ask questions about trends and we were as thorough as possible to map out uh, the global trends uh, by our own desktop research and uh, by also picking the brains of the, of the people who were involved. Um, and then uh, we were looking for the most, for those that are plausible, because I mean they were not falsified by uh, you know, the future is hardly falsifiable until it happens a different way that, that was planned. Um, but the assumptions were simply not being um, falsified by the other group as as not true as as contradictory too much, and at the same time that uh, we were picking those which were different enough, the scenarios, uh, different from one another, producing, producing the, the composition of, of these trends that, uh, that would show that there are different paths. Because essentially it's, a, it's an exercise in narratives. And for narratives you don't have that much of a methodology. You, uh, however you operate them, and you know that narratives are influential also in pushing certain projecting certain future as well as describing uh, the direction uh, that is already taking place, just like in hist history. If you, if, you, if you allow us to I mean, stop there on the methodological question, uh, I would be very happy, of course, uh, there, are, there are more challenges uh, to this uh, thought process and, and experiments. And, and the second question uh, that you ask is about possibility or kind of r ranking of possibility there. We try to our best, uh, best of our possibility, our abilities to to find out and to to narrate these scenarios uh, in a way that they are equally rooted in the current moment. So they are, if you take possibility, uh, we w we couldn't even order make an order of preference. However. Time-wise, uh, you can already uh, set certain uh, benchmarks uh, to to check which scenario is more likely. It's it's more it's much more into play than, than the others. Uh, benchmarks like this are set also in the in the trends. Uh, for instance, these are uh, political elections because of the European elections in, in May. Uh, we will this will verify, for instance, the illiberal euro very much. Confirming the trend, denying the, the, the such, a, such a possibility of, of development of such a scenario, and other uh, other elections in the, in the future. Uh, so there is a foreseeable number of factors that will play out, 
and we can attribute them to a certain time frame within the seven years, and perhaps later also, um, which will make some scenarios more probable as, as, as the time goes, goes by. We did, however, uh, have some preferences. I mean, obviously, we think I must say for, for both of us uh, that we are looking into hopeful that be it a shotgun wedding or maybe some degree of the generational change that are taking place uh, to reverse the, the most negative ones because for sure we can agree on uh, that the fifth scenario, the last one, is, is the most negative and not and the first one, the triumph of liberalism, because of how unstable it, it would be, it's also not a preferred choice. Let me just add, I mean for me the, the useful, I mean the, on the methodology it's very easy for me. I mean, uh, we basically ask a whole lot of what if questions. Sort of kind of question. uh, and I mean, with that, you can then sort of uh, develop chains of, uh, of development or of, sort of evolution almost uh, of, of situations. Uh, the value for me here is not so much the, the, the prediction value. I mean, we, we're not trying to predict anything, but it's a mapping exercise. Because what you have is that these these five uh, trajectories give you uh, combinations of uh, um, uh, of factors um, that leading to very different outcomes, obviously. Um, but if you look at uh, that, then uh, give you a, a tool to uh, sort of relate to reality. That is, uh, since we are at this uh, at this scenario. Uh, two, three weeks ago, the Polish president goes to Poland, uh, goes to the United States, and is sort of very, uh, very strongly advocating for a U.S. military presence in uh, Poland. That is a coping strategy in the sense of this scenario, because uh, he's trying to establish a sort of more bilateral uh, uh, guarantee. So what you can do with these scenarios is uh, they, they constitute a sort of map where you can take individual events, even individual sort of election outcomes or programs of politicians or statements or uh, this Klippal uh, case earlier this year in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And you can basically put this, uh, put this into these scenarios because they, uh, these developments all fit into, uh, into that map. Uh, and that helps a little bit, or quite a bit in my opinion, uh, to put at least some uh, some logic into into developments that we see at the moment already, because all these scenarios are at play. Uh, and uh, and this is where it then relates to the to the policy recommendations. It basically helps you to think through uh, current uh, 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 policy decisions uh, uh, and assess them against uh, their consequences in uh, in a map like this. So. I mean, that, that for me is the more practical value. Uh, it's basically a sort of mapping and to some extent an ordering exercise. Uh, uh, the paper uh, provides uh, scenarios for the development, possible developments of the whole region, but it also actually uh, somehow provides us with uh, scenarios for individual countries. And uh, what uh, every reader actually can uh, take out uh, from this is that uh, Poland is often mentioned as a country that might become uh, once again the trigger of uh, the region and uh, the actually the most enthusiastic actually uh, engine of the of the uh, of the region. It uh, reminds me the early 80s that you are referring to. And I believe it is not only because Poland is the biggest country in the region, but also because there, there exist actually some preconditions that Poland might be aspiring uh, for this role. So I would be interested in your view of it. Eh? And then uh, definitely the country with the darkest uh, scenario uh, is Hungary, no doubts about that. Uh, I would say that uh, it's quite visible that uh, there are almost no actually positive uh, signs uh, for the future development of Hungary. Isn't it too dark here from your perspective? Uh, I even remember that at one of our meetings we had together, the, it was the Hungarian representative who mentioned that the death of uh, the, the leader of the country or the leading representative of the country might be the trigger for the changing of the situation, which also says a lot about the situation on the ground there in Hungary. So Poland can we be 
optimistic and Hungary should we be so pessimistic? I, 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 I would start by saying it's not about optimistic or pessimistic, but um, Poland is perhaps the least orderly in any sense of these four. Um, uh, you know, and it's not just current state of affairs. I mean, we cannot, we cannot follow by the book Viktor Orban's illiberalist, uh, illiberal practices. Not only because he is political inventor, and you cannot copy invention simply because they are already. You can see that the European Commission, for instance, is prepared to some of some of the actions or some of the steps uh, that Hungary has been taking. So some, someone who tries to copy-paste the model um, is met with uh, better prepared uh, response and not so much delayed as in the case of Hungary. But uh, simply, I mean, also historically, you know, I can go deep into the history. But let me stop at Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was writing about Polish anarchy as the, as the basic feature of Polish political culture back in the, in the Enlightenment, and and that these features of Poland, Polish uh, political culture, has been present until today, and the conflicting, uh, should I say, uh, uh, forces in the society, in politics, in how the country is organized, uh, are providing quite a quite a dynamic and vibrant uh, society and politics, completely different, I would say. Okay, not completely, but in many ways different to to, to the dynamics you see. Uh, elsewhere, especially in, in Hungary, and because uh, it's you know it's so much more unpredictable than in case of Hungary, you may put the question mark whether this country could be the source of you know another direction, a new uh, new new turn, uh, uh, which of course I mean I, I wouldn't get a political science degree with all these claims, but uh, and I never had one. Um, but I would say that it's it's quite. Um, this is something that you uh, you can you can build your expectations towards Poland, where the the conflicting trends within it um, are producing the outcomes that that produce eventually perhaps some some more of a positive dynamics. Um, and yes, of course there are, there are many other elements, but I would like to expose uh, expose this feature. Um, as, as compared, for instance, to, to, to Hungary.